And the speaker today is uh, ETH uh, student. Um, started with me in his master's, got his uh, medal for his master thesis, and he's trying to come up with uh, effective to calculate entanglement measures for realistic quantum many body systems. So, please, Christian. Okay, thank you very much Odette for the introduction and thank you very much for allowing me to speak here. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak in front of a live audience and not my computer screen, because I think my screen grew really tired of my face the last one and a half years. So I've read on the homepage on this Quantum F Center flagship forum that it's a day to celebrate quantum research and to discuss hot topics in quantum research. Um, Okay, I have to connect this. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hope no one got blind, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, why hot topics in quantum research, such as quantum systems in the form of quantum devices? For example, this very beautiful 8-qubit quantum processor developed in Andreas Walraff's quantum device lab across the street. Why are they so hot? I mean, because they promise to be very powerful at solving very complicated tasks. And what makes them so powerful? It's actually their ability to create and harness entanglements in these systems. Now, entanglement is a very fundamental quantum process, as all of you know. So it's not only here in quantum devices, but it's all over the place. So we find entanglement is very important in quantum protocols, such as quantum teleportation, but also in condensed matter phenomena, such as condo physics, or even as an analysis tool in quantum phase transitions. There's also more exotic things happening with entanglement, so you see it in neural network states, and even in the process of photosynthesis. So I think uh, this makes clear why it's very important to understand entanglement. Now, we like to think of all of these quantum systems to be in a pure state, because that's much easier. And for pure states, everything is fine. We, the entanglement between two compositions of the, or two subsystems of the whole system, A and B, is well understood. And we have tools at hand to measure it, and that at a reasonable computational cost. Now, you might ask yourself, what's that ugly pink blob? So, unfortunately, I'm a theorist, and quantum systems for me don't look like this, but like this. But on the other hand, they're also much uh, less expensive. <laughs> okay, but unfortunately, quantum systems usually interact with an environment. We cannot isolate them perfectly. So we usually find them in a mixed state. Now for mixed states, bipartite entanglement between two subsystems turns out to be much less understood and much harder to measure. So when I talk about measuring entanglement, now for pure or uh, mixed states, what do we actually mean? We want something like this telescope to look at this bipartite quantum system and tell us about the quantum correlations between the two parts. Now, a good measure should fulfill three things. It should be an entanglement monotone, which means that if I act locally on just one of the subsystems, it should not influence the entanglement measure, because it should not influence the entanglement between the two subsystems. And it also should reduce to some known measure for pure states, and to, as I have told, we have measures for pure states. And finally, it should be easy to compute, analytically or at reasonable computational cost, otherwise it's not very useful. Now, because it's such an important topic, and it's all over the place in quantum systems, there has been a lot of effort and research in this area. And a lot of different measures of mixed state uh, entanglement have been proposed, and also proven useful for many specific tasks. Now, unfortunately, so far we lack a satisfactory entanglement measure for reasonably large many-body systems. I want to highlight the negativity. It is easy to compute with the density matrix, 
but it fails to detect every entangled mixed state. So some of them cannot be entangled with negativity. On the other hand, there's the operator space entanglement entropy, which is the straightforward generalization of the well-known entanglement entropy of pure states. And this one fails to be an entanglement monotone because it also includes and is sensitive to classical correlations and not only quantum correlations. Now, in our group, with our research, we have shown that we should, or we could look at the entanglement spectrum of the mixed state, and it's also the title of the talk, and I will tell you why this is cool, and why we should look at it, and what we can do with it. Because when we look at the entanglement spectrum of the mixed state, we can define an entanglement measure for mixed states that fulfills these three criteria. Now, before I tell you about the entanglement spectrum of mixed states, I will walk you through the derivation of the entanglement spectrum of pure states, because that is well known, and this then lays the ground for the more complicated mixed case. I will show you how we derive a measure from the entanglement spectrum, and then show you the measure in action at two simple examples. Okay, pure states. Again, there's this pink blob, two subsystems, we label it A and B, the two of them can interact with each other, but not with any environment, it's completely isolated. Now, because it's a pure state, we can describe it by the state vector psi, or equivalently with the density matrix, which is, for the pure state, a rank one matrix. Now, if you want to access the correlations between subsystem A and subsystem B, one way to do this is to trace out the degrees of freedom of one of the subsystems using the partial trace, here shown at the example of subsystem B. So we get rid of the degrees of freedom of subsystem B, and this gives us the reduced density matrix of subsystem A only. Now we define the entanglement spectrum of pure states as the eigenvalues of this reduced density matrix. And it's also well known under the name of Schmidt values of the pure state. And I write it as square numbers because it's real numbers and it's positive real numbers. Now, actually, this entanglement spectrum of the pure state with respect to bipartition is actually all we need to know everything about the entanglement between the subsystems. For example, we can sum it up to the well-known entanglement entropy. I will show why this actually works to detect entanglement. If we have a pure state that is non-entangled, so there's no entanglement between subsystem A and B, we find that the reduced density matrix itself describes a pure state. What then happens is that the entanglement spectrum is trivial. It's just a one and the rest is zero. And we plug it in in the entanglement entropy, we find that the entanglement entropy is zero, so no entanglement between the subsystems. On the other hand, if we have an entangled state between subsystem A and B, the reduced density matrix will give us a mixed state. So, for example, a mixture of two pure states. Now, if these are orthonormal, the entanglement spectrum will be like this. It's just the two values here of the mixture, and the rest again zero. When you plug this in, in the entanglement entropy, we find it's bigger than zero. So it detected the bipartite entanglement of pure states. And I said, that's all we need. For pure states, we're all set. We can measure the entanglement. Now, unfortunately, the real world is never as easy as we want it to be, and the quantum states usually are mixed. Now, for mixed states, it looks very similar. We still have subsystem A, subsystem B. Now, we're not completely isolated from an environment. So the system can interact with some iron environment, and the two subsystems also interact with each other. Now this influences the interaction with the environment, influences the entanglement between the subsystem, and that makes it very hard to measure the bipartite entanglement for mixed states. However, we can still try to do it. Again, we can trace out the degrees of freedom of subsystem B. Now for the mixed states, we cannot do this via the density matrix, but we have to do it via a higher order operator, which we get from the vectorized density matrix. Now, because we have a mixed state, 
the density matrix is not a rank one matrix anymore. It's not described by this state vector psi. Now, very similar to the pure case, we can define the entanglement spectrum of the mixed case, of the mixed state, as the eigenvalues of this piece now. Again, I write it as squared numbers because it's real positive numbers. And this entanglement spectrum of mixed states is also known under the name of operator space, entanglement spectrum. And people have used it to define the operator space entanglement entropy straightforwardly like the entanglement entropy of pure case, of the pure state. Now, unfortunately, as said, this is not an entanglement monotone. And we cannot use it to measure the entanglement between subsystem A and B if the whole system is in a mixed state. Now, our research has shown that instead of summing up the values into an entanglement entropy, we should look at the values themselves. Namely, if you look at the system where you have a fixed particle number, we can distinguish the values and label them by values that encode entanglement and others that don't. Now, the ones that don't, we should not include in any entanglement measure for mixed states. And then we did the most naive thing, which just uh, summed up these values into what we call an entanglement measure for mixed states. Turns out, okay, it ticks the boxes of an entanglement measure. It is an entangled monotone, and that's because of the selection process, because we only choose the values that encode entanglement. It reduces to a known measure for pure states, namely the negativity that I have shown in a previous slide. And finally, it is easy to compute, because in any tensor network representation of density matrix, matrices, this entanglement spectrum is just thrown at you for free. Well, that's really cool. And now I will show you this measure at two examples. First, single particle on four sides. We consider four sides, and the two left side is subsystem A, and the two right side is subsystem B, and we cut in the middle. Now, because it's only a single particle, the density matrix reduces to the Fock block of single particle states. And if we choose a suitable basis now, we can label these blocks by the configurations of the single particle with respect to the bipartition. So the single particle can either live in subsystem A, in subsystem B, or it can be coherently distributed across the bipartition. And now you already see that only the third case can encode entanglement. The others are local to the subsystems. And the higher order operator with the partial trace I've shown before now arranges these four blocks on a diagonal. So that's a matrix with diagonal blocks. It's block diagonal. And it also compresses them because it gets rid of some degrees of freedom. And now this exactly allows us to label the spectral values and decide which ones we want to include in an entanglement measure and which ones we don't. So look at, we look at an example. We look at an entangled pure state, which we mix with its own fully decohered version. Now, what does that mean? So in the limit, this is our tuning knob parameter, Xi. For Xi zero, we're in the pure limit. So it's just a pure state. For Xi one, we're in the fully decohered limit in which the density matrix is diagonal. So there are no quantum correlations present, because there are no coherence values present. OK, now let's look what happens. We find that for this pure state and the mixture, we get two eigenvalues corresponding to the particles being in subsystem A and in subsystem B. And they come from these two diagonal blocks. They're actually rank one. And for increasing mixture, they decrease, but they saturate at a finite value. Now, interestingly, the eigenvalue of these blocks is the same, and we find it's only a single one. And it does, amazingly, what we would want for an entanglement measure. Namely, it decreases monotonously with the mixture, and it vanishes completely in the case of only classical correlations. Let's compare it to negativity. 
Oh, it turns out it's exactly the same. So not only the limit of pure case of the pure state, it's equal to the negativity, but over the whole thing. So that's the second thing we wanted for an entanglement measure. It should be equal to a known entanglement measure for pure states, namely the negativity. Now we can also compare it to the entanglement entropy, the operator space entanglement entropy, and we see that this one decreases with increasing mixture but saturates at a finite value. What's more, we can construct an example where the entanglement spectrum shows and explains why the operator space entanglement entropy cannot be an entanglement monotone. Namely, if we prepare a pure state in a way that it only has contributions from the particle living in subsystem A. Now we do the same, we mix this pure state with its fully decohered version, we end up with only a single eigenvalue from the diagonal block encoding the particle being in subsystem A. And it turns out that the operator space entanglement entropy increases with increasing mixture, which it should not as entanglement measure because there's no entanglement present via the bipartition if the particle is restricted to subsystem A. Okay, I mean, that was single particle physics. You might think that's pretty boring. We can also go to two particles. Now, if you restrict to two particles, the density matrix again restricts to the two particle Fock block. It's now much more possible configurations, but we can still label them with the configurations of the two particles with respect to the bipartition. Now, both of them can either live in subsystem A, subsystem B, or coherently distributed across the bipartition. For simplicity, oh, oh, I forgot to mention that the higher order operator with the partial trace again does the same thing as in the single particle case. It arranges the blocks on the diagonal and compresses them. And this again allows us to label and decide which eigenvalues, which spectral values we should include in our measure and which we don't want to include. Now for simplicity, we look at the pure state with no contributions from both particles being subsystem B. That's just to reduce the number of values, because in principle now we could have had a whole bunch of eigenvalues and the picture would be really crowded. Okay, we can look at the pure state, an entangled pure state mixed with, with its own fully decohered version. We find that we have contributions from both particles in subsystem A, there's a single eigenvalue from this block, and very similar to the single particle example, we find contributions from one particle being in subsystem A and one coherently distributed across the cut, and these values monotonously decrease with increasing mixture. Now the more interesting block is this AB block here, which describes one particle in the left and one in the right. Now for this configuration, we can have both classical correlations between the two particles and quantum correlations, so entanglement between the two particles. And that's actually, interestingly, what we see in the spectrum. So for this block, we find values that describe classical correlations and a value that describes quantum correlations and monotonously decreases with the mixture. Now we just add up all the values that encode entanglement to get to our measure, which we label M here. Again, we compare it to negativity and we find it's actually equal in the limit of the pure state. And it closely follows the negativity also for the rest, but it's not exactly equal. Okay, so with these two examples, I'd like to conclude. So we have shown that for mixed states with a fixed particle number, we should look at the entanglement spectrum and via the entanglement spectrum, we can define an entanglement measure for mixed case, such as this telescope, which takes all the boxes. It is an entanglement monotone. It reduces to a known measure, namely the negativity in the limit of pure states. And it is, easy, it is easy to compute because we get it from tensor network representations. Okay, now that's not the end of the story. I said that we get it from tensor network representations. Now, you know that tensor network representations of quantum states usually rely on the entanglement behavior. Now, could we use our analysis maybe to get a new class of quantum states that could be represented as tensor networks? 
Now, it would also be very interesting to lift the restriction on the number of particles and see what happens if we start with fog block mixing. So what does it mean if we mix the single two-particle case or any n-particle case? What happens to the spectral values? Now, these analytical tools and numerical tools, I mean, they're very interesting and nice, but after all, they're just here to solve hands-on problems. And because entanglement is everywhere in quantum systems, it would actually be really nice to apply the new measure to some of the very interesting systems that I have shown in the beginning. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. And I leave you with this nice picture of our group. Without them, it would not have been possible to do this research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Questions? Yes, please. Have you tried to look at simple toy master equations to see how the um, entanglement spectrum changes in time? I mean, just to see a, a certain influence of the environment, which, which would, how it would affect the system. So we did, actually, the, the example that we've shown, you can also write it as a master equation. But it's a very trivial example. It's real-time evolution. Yeah. And then you can follow it. So you can make an algorithm that identifies the value and follows it. That's the idea. Yes. So that, that's when Christian shows the hammer. <laughs> right. That's the idea. So do you need the experimentalist to be able to give you a density matrix for the state of their system? And that's a good question. So if we have the density matrix, we can certainly get the spectrum. Mm. But maybe there's another way with projective measurements, maybe to get part of the information or part of the spectrum, and that would already be enough to tell us certain things about entanglement in the systems. Because with, these value, with the values, we can even connect them to certain states, and then it would be interesting. If you project on these states, you already find the entanglement corresponding to that state, or that state that uh, contributes to your full density matrix. Mm -hmm. So because now, now the, at least the sort of things like the chip on the right get, get sort of to a size where like at 17 qubits or so, we already have a hard time to just measure yes. the density matrix. And so, so you're saying you could look at then some, even with your method at some specific components of the state to still in, in, uh, evaluate your entanglement. Exactly, or get some bound, the lower bound of the entanglement present in the system, for example. Uh, I guess last question. Thank you. Um, so you, uh, you compute the entanglement by picking the eigenvalues and adding them up. Mm -hmm. And you pick them because you know something about your system. Yes. And. Uh, for larger systems, is it always possible to pick the ones that, that you think are necessary? I guess that will be the tricky question, how to pick the values. But we thought of an algorithm that might uh, be able to help us. So imagine we have a quantum system, it might have evolve in time, and at a certain point you want to know which of the spectral values correspond to entanglement. You could actually use something like the example we've shown here and start to decohere the state and then follow the spectral values and see which ones go to zero and vanish in the limit of the fully decohered state. And that might already tell you which ones in the beginning were the ones encoding entanglement. Then is that still easy to compute? Is it efficient? Yes. Okay. For the examples we look at, yes. For example, these numerical representations, it's still efficient. Okay, so in light of time, let's thank Christian again. Thank you. Thank you.